Okay, I'll uh, thank the other organizers for inviting me to talk. Um, and uh, so the, the title of the talk is, I think, I think it got changed to something like Prospects for a Quantum PCP Theorem. Um, I'm actually quite pessimistic that, it, that this holds, but uh, I'm less pessimistic than I used to be. And so in this talk, I want to talk about um, what, what such a theorem would be, but also sort of some ideas, many from topology, that give us some idea of how we could at least try and uh, maybe prove it and at least also prove some weaker conjectures that I'll mention. So I want to start by talking a little bit about some, some classical problems, and I'll explain what this PCP theorem is. So let me just give um, a list of examples. Suppose we have um, a one-dimensional. So let's just start by writing some classical systems. And suppose we just have a one-dimensional system, you know, spins on a line. And it's some classical coupling. Each one couples to the neighbor. And uh, so at each site, you know, um, there's maybe not just you know, two states, but three, four, some fixed order one dimensional thing. And let's ask what happens in this case classically. Um, this table is going to be quite useful. I'm going to sort of do a series of, of, of examples by, to argue by analogy in a little bit to motivate some later stuff that happens. And uh, let's ask also first what happens if the Hamiltonian is just, to give an example, the ferromagnetic Ising model. So on each site, there is uh, two states sometimes called spin up and spin down. And the Hamiltonian just says that neighboring states would like to be in the same state. So if you study this Hamiltonian, um, what you find is that there's long range order at zero temperature. So you know, either at zero temperature, you either have the state all spins up or all spins down. But no long range order at uh, any, any non-zero temperature, any non-zero temperature. So this is just sort of standard old result in physics. And also, if instead of considering the ferromagnetic ising, you consider some, uh, we could call it a spin glass Hamiltonian, but just some sort of completely arbitrary interaction between nearest neighbors. So there's some interaction between this spin and the neighboring spin and this spin and the neighboring spin and so on chosen in some way, it's actually quite easy to find the exact ground state. This is an algorithm known in many fields, I guess it's dynamic programming, transfer matrix, and so on. But it's quite easy to find. So uh, exact ground state, uh, ground state is easy, is easy to find when you go to this, when you do an arbitrary Hamiltonian. Now let's go to 2D. Let's see what happens when we go to two dimensions. So you have, say, a square lattice. If you now consider the ferromagnetic Ising model on a square lattice, there's actually long range order if you do it in thermal equilibrium for some temperatures t less than some critical temperature. And this critical temperature is, is strictly greater than 0. So there's really some temperature at which a phase transition happens. So you have a long range order below a certain temperature. Um, but now finding the exact ground state is hard. It's hard to find the exact ground state of the system. And this is classic result. That is, it's, it's NP hard to find the exact ground state of, of such a system if I have arbitrary interactions. Of course, not for the ferromagnetic ising, but if I have sort of arbitrary interactions between neighboring spins on a 2D square lattice, this is a hard problem. Um, but although the exact ground state is hard, let me know if this is hard to read. Um, the approximate, approximate is easy. And what do I mean by saying that the approximate is easy? Well. Um, Suppose you want to approximate the ground state energy to a constant fraction. You want to get the ground state energy to an accuracy of 1%. So, so roughly speaking, you do the following. You, know, you have your, your two-dimensional square lattice. So you have your, your couplings like this. OK, so you know, it's some large square lattice. So I'll just draw some big box to indicate the whole system. You know, so there's many sites in here. And what you do is you take your system and you break it up I'll just erase the square lattice. You break it up into cells of size, let's say little l by little l, squares of this size. And you ignore all the interactions on the boundary of these patches, all the interactions along this line or along this line and so on. And you exactly solve the system in every single one of these patches. So by doing this, you get a reasonable approximation to the ground state. How good are you on energy? Well, you've missed all these terms, all the terms on the boundary here. And they represent a certain fraction of the system size. What fraction? Well, if the whole system has dimension capital L, the fraction of terms that live on these boundaries is of order little l over capital L. So that gives you some estimate of your approximation. So 
you know, where epsilon is the, the relative accuracy to which you commute, compute the energy. If you do it this way, this is sort of roughly your, your approximation accuracy. You, you know, there's some technical details of certain of the bonds are stronger than certain other bonds, and then you have to pay attention to where you, where you put these cuts. But this is a general <coughs> idea. And how hard is it to do this? Well, to solve in one of these patches, I can just exhaustively enumerate all the states in the patch, and it takes a time that's exponential in the patch size. But if epsilon is some fixed number, like 1%, then this patch size is some fixed value. And so um, this, the size will be a constant, will be, a, will be linear in the system size. Is that clear? So some people are looking a little bit confused, so I want to make sure. I think maybe you just meant 1 over the uh, This is, um, uh, epsilon is little l over, uh, ah, yes, of course, of course, sorry, thank you. Yeah, 1 over little l is what I meant to write. Um, yeah, yeah, so the, the, the accuracy would be 1 over little l, thank you, yeah. Um, one over little l. So as we make this little l bigger, uh, I guess that's what I said in words, that if you sort of have epsilon is 0.01, you need your patches of size sort of 100. Yeah, of course, it's, uh, that's what it does. So, so it's, it's actually easy to approximate the ground state if your notion of approximation is approximation to a constant factor, to you know, a, something that's <coughs> extensive, proportional to the number of sites. And um, similarly, I'll just mention back on this side of the, the ferromagnetic Ising table, there are low energy states without long range order exist. And what do I mean by this? I mean, I can write down a state which has relatively low energy, but where if you look at the expectation value of two randomly chosen spins, this is for the ferromagnetic Ising model, it's quite close to a half. Or, I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're, it's sort of equally likely to point in the same way as opposite ways. And the way you do it is easy. You just take all the spins in this patch and point them up and all this, the spins in this patch and point them down and so on. And if you take two randomly chosen spins, they're sort of equally likely to come from the up patches or the down patches. So the correlation between two far away spins is small. So you have only, uh, no you have no long range correlations and yet this state also has low energy. It has again the same one over L energy. Um, and then the last example, if we go to, um, as Aaron was talking about, expander graphs. So if we put the system on an expander graph, <coughs> So you have some graph for the interactions. So you know each site couples to a few sites, each of which couples to a few more, and so on. And it kind of looks locally like a tree, but grows outwards. We can again consider what happens. And one of the remarkable things is that when we go to the ferromagnetic Ising model, low energy states without long range order do not exist if you have good enough expansion properties and you have talk about low enough energy. So no low energy states, states without long range order. And what do I mean by that? Well, so you take your expander graph and you're going to assign some of the spins to be up and some of the spins to be down. And if we want to have um, no long range order, well, it shouldn't be that, uh, sorry, it, we, it should be that sort of 50% of the spins are up and 50% of the spins are down, rather than you know say 100% of the spins up or 90% of the spins up. So sort of half should be up and half should be down. So what we could do is we could uh, you know, color each of the sites of the graph, or in fact, let's just color one set of sites. We'll color the set of sites where the upspins are. So you know, so maybe the upspins will be these sets of sites like this, and then the downspins will be the sites that I haven't colored. So you pick out some set of vertices, which will be the, the upspins, and this will be roughly half the size of the graph by construction. Half the vertices will be these upspins. And if you have certain expansion properties, um, it, for, for, for many of these graphs, you still have expansion even when you take a set that's half the size of the graph. And so you know that the number of sites, the number of edges which are on the boundary between an upspin and a downspin like this one is again proportional to the number of upspins. So the, the energy will be proportional to the number of sites. So as soon as I say that I have, have no long range order, I have uh, also no low energy, yeah. So your title is classical, but you are kind of sneaking in some quantum there. I, I don't and think I put any quantum there. I'm gonna go quantum in a second. Where, where is uh, the quantum? It sounds quantum because you are talking about spins and- Oh, and well, no, no, so, so just say that, <laughs> that, no, no, when I call them spins, it just means there are two, when I say classical, it just means there are two states, zero and one, or up and down. Yeah, but, but in the, in the ferro, but you are talking about the ferromagnetic mo model, yeah. and that could have like a, a entangled no, 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 no. This is this is a classical model. This is a classical Hamiltonian. That is, the, some the terms in the Hamiltonian are just to use quantum terminology, S Z I S Z J. But they all they all are diagonal in this product basis. So they just are whether a spin is up is, is zero or one or up or down. You know, if you prefer, I'll call them bits. If it if it makes it sound less quantum, I'll call them bits. 
you know. So this thus far is completely classical. You got a question in the back? So what's the critical temperature for, uh, can you give some intuition for, for the, when the long range order um, stops at 2D? So it stops already, you know, you've given examples where it stops, but where, where, is, where is that pressure? Um, well, so for the 2D square lattice, you can actually calculate it exactly. Um, this is a this work of, uh, uh, well, uh, Kramer's and Vanier, and then later Onsager's exact solution. Um, they, they previously knew the exact temperature. But there's also an argument called the Pyrrhus argument, which is much more general, which lets you prove it even for lattices where you can't solve it exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a tiny number. It's actually fairly high, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a log for, of what was great of yeah. Um, so, so I think I think I will give maybe a little more intuition in a bit as to why it's non-zero uh, when I talk about some stuff. But but yeah, it's it's, it's a number that's that's known exactly, you know, mathematically exactly. It's, it's not small. But other questions? Okay. Okay. Good. So I so I made this table. This was the classical setting. Now I want to make a table in the uh, in the quantum context. So I want to talk about some uh, quantum models. Oh, yes, 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 of course. Yeah, I forgot the most important one. Yes, thank you. I got, I, I got distracted for a second. So the most, the most important thing, and this is, this is, to my mind, like one of the most amazing things that computer scientists have ever uh, told physicists, perhaps, is that um, <laughs> approximate is hard. At this point, finding the approximate state is hard. If you even want to, if you take some, and this is the PCP theorem. Uh, so if you, if you have some, some, fixed size alphabet on each of these sites and some local interaction. Um, if you even want to approximate the energy to a certain factor, say, you know, 1%, this is, this is an NP-hard problem. You know, I don't know exactly what the exact factors of approximation are at which this becomes hard. This will depend upon what class of Hamiltonians you consider. But it's really hard to even get a finite, you know, a, a, a fixed non-zero accuracy of approximation, which is, which is kind of remarkable. And it's really special to the fact that we do it on an expander graph. Because this trick of cutting it into patches and saying I solve in every patch. This would work in 2D, would work in 3D, would work in 4D, and so on. But here it doesn't work, because if you try and cut it into little segments and solve on each segment, you find that there's just as much stuff between your patches as there is in the patches. So you make a large error. Yeah. So now I'm beginning to wonder what you mean by ferromagnetic icing, or maybe you said that I missed a few details. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm basically trying to keep two columns. This column is. Uh, in every case, there's some alphabet of sites on here. And in this column, there's, there's only two states on each site, up and down, or 0 and 1. And the Hamiltonian is just penalizes it if they're not pointing in the same direction. Oh, they're not in the okay. same state. And this is if we consider a totally arbitrary one. OK, some, some matrix of, some, some matrix to describe pairwise interaction. Yeah, so in this case, it's just some arbitrary matrix for pairwise interaction. Yeah. Whereas in this case, it's specifically the ferromagnetic Ising model that says that says we penalize them if they don't point the same way. Right. right. So that's why I have two columns. Maybe the I should draw. Still diagonal, though. Underline. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, I'm drawing a line to separate this column from this column to so make it. Was the horizontal purple line that was missing? Okay. Oh yeah, <laughs> then I drew a line here, but not there. Good. Okay. Yes. I, I, was there another question? Dorit? Yes. Yeah, so you're saying in 2D that there is long range order at low temperature, yes. but there exists uh, low uh, energy states without yes. long range order. How does it, can you explain? Yeah, yeah, I mean, these, these states are quite special, right? I sort of very carefully put where I put the defects. So it's just that they're rare? Yeah, yeah, they're rare. Entropy is, is sort of crucial in a way to getting the long range order. Yeah. Um, so is do you have a mathematical definition of what long range order means? Or um, how should I think of it? In this context, let's say, um, in this context for a meeting, I'm going to make an analogy of the quantum thing. But to make all these, a, a, a statement that fits with all these is to say, let's look at, I'll use the quantum notation, SZI, SZJ. So I and J are sites. And uh, sum them over all I and J and divide by the number of sites squared. And so SZ is plus or minus 1 and ask whether this quantity is uh, 0 or something sort of order 1 over n away from 0, or whether it's a number that's you know, fixed away from 0, bounded, circuit bounded away from 0. This is OK. OK, um, okay good. So now let me make this uh, the, the analogous quantum table. Now, in quantum, 
uh, we don't know too much about this column. Kind of the interest is in the corner of PCP is whether we can do much about this column. But let me talk about sort of a column that in a way is the analog of this ferromagnetic Ising model, Hubble column. So what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the toric code or generalizations of the toric code, various forms of this. Um, this is a particular quantum Hamiltonian um, that uh, is studied a lot. It's a, it's a good example of a Hamiltonian uh, with topological order, and I'll, I'll try to state what that is. So let's, let's start with the two-dimensional toric code. The, the table is now going to start in two dimensions rather than in one dimension for things to be interesting. So in the two-dimensional toric code, what we have here is we have a lattice. The degrees of freedoms actually live on the bonds of the lattice here. And on each bond, there's a spin. And the Hamiltonian has two terms. There's a sum over all the plaquettes of the Hamiltonian. And it's a product of all the bonds that are in that plaquette, the SZ on that bond. And then also a sum over all the vertices, a product over all the bonds that are adjacent to that uh, vertex, and then the SX on that, that one. So the Hamiltonian is the sum of these two terms. Um, I, probably some people are extremely familiar with this, and some people are not as familiar with this. Um, it, it, the particular property I'm going to talk about that it has is a property called topological order. So this thing has a remarkable property called topological order, uh, order at t equals 0, but no topological order for t greater than 0, and also no topological order for low energy states. So what does it mean, topological order? this remarkable property of this Hamiltonian. And what it means is that um, if you could take the ground state, of, there's, there's many definitions, and I'm going to be quite loose for most of this talk about epsilons, except for the few places where I give like the, the, the interesting conjectures, where then I'll try and put the epsilons in so that you can, you know, you know, those will be stated precisely. But a lot of it, I'm just going to be, due to shortness of time and so on, I'm going to be quite loose about epsilons. Um, so what does it mean, topological order? To define topological order, I sort of need to define the opposite of it. I need to define a trivial state. So what is a trivial state? So first, a product state state is trivial. So if I have a whole bunch of different spins or what have you degrees of freedom, and they're in a and I'm just talking about pure states at the moment. We'll we'll talk about mixed states. You may wonder, you know, t greater than zero mixed states. What does this mean? Um, I'm just going to talk about pure states for a second. Um, if you just have each spin is pointing in some direction, uh, in some product state, this is a trivial state. Also, anything I can get from a product state by a low depth quantum circuit, low depth short range quantum circuit, will also be considered trivial. So if I have some state, I'll draw it in one dimension that's a product state like this, and you can apply some gates to it. <coughs> maybe you, know, you have a few rounds of this quantum circuit. Maybe the gates are not even just acting on two qubits, but act on three at a time, something like that. But as long as the quantum circuit is, uh, has some bounds on its depth and range acting on the initial state, we will also call this to be a trivial state. Um, this will also be considered to be a trivial state. Um, more precisely, OK, so, so uh, quantum circuit on product. And for use later, let me define something to be um, R trivial. R trivial will just mean that it can be obtained from one of these quantum circuits with the range of the quantum circuit being at most R. What is the range of the quantum circuit? We'll sort of look at how the range of each of these unitaries and add it up over all the rounds. So sort of that's how much it can spread out operators. So R trivial will say um, the range of the circuit. Circuit. So, so, so how would you define this in a continuum? Because normally it's with, uh, with continuum, no? It's like with uh, some exponential evolution that you cannot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so when we want to go to the continuum, we will need to have a lot of epsilons in terms of like truncating things and so on. So no, I don't, I don't mean continuum in space, but continuum in time. Uh, um, oh, whether I would want to make this by like a continuous time yeah, evolution. Yeah, by Hamiltonian evolution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so right. So, so anything that we obtain by continuous time evolution, we can obtain mm -hmm. up to small error with one of these continuous evolutions. And then, like just as you mentioned in your intro talk, we sort of need to start worrying about how big the errors are when we do this. And as I'm saying in this talk, I'm going to kind of gloss over all those issues with what the epsilons are. But this r trivial would kind of be related to the to, to the, the light speed light. Yeah, 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 it just says like that's code. basically the lieb robinson velocity times the time. It's the exactly. range. Yeah. yeah. So this is just a measure of sort of you, you know that the correlations can only have spread up to this this range or, or twice this range. Oh. So 
But oh. if we're so in an expander graph, would you say it's R or exponentially in R? Uh, in an expander? I mean, so the range will be the, the number of qubits? Oh, no, no, it's just the actual range. Sorry, it's just the literal range, yeah. Okay. So if I go, and also in every context in this talk, I mean, we talk about R being basically fixed or not fixed, so you don't need to worry too much as R, like, you know, 10 or e to the 10. It's, they're both O of 1, so. Uh, um, okay, so... Uh, so, so topological order just means not trivial. There is, no, there is no trivial state that's the ground state. In fact, there's no trivial state that even approximates the ground state, even if you take this R to be quite large, uh, as long as the R is still small compared to the system size. Yeah, yeah. You know, the explanations of trivial states in Yes, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so uh, uh, if I go to T greater than zero, I need to have a, an appropriate definition for, for this, and we can, then, then we can have yeah, com, uh, convex, so some, some mixture of these trivial states. So, um, the remarkable thing is that this thing has a property of topological order at zero temperature and no topological order above zero temperature. Um, if I go to four dimensions, you may wonder why I'm going you know, two and four here, and I'll maybe give some intuition. Um, there's another version of the Torah code where you go to a four dimensional lattice, and um, the remarkable thing is that this even has topological order for T smaller than some critical temperature, and again, this critical temperature is strictly positive. Yeah, Dorian. Can, can you say exactly, when you say no topological order for T larger than zero, which yeah. does not mean for energy larger than something, you actually, so you actually do some, you didn't really define it, right? No, I didn't really uh, define it. Okay. Uh, I didn't really define what it means to have topological order for mixed states. Uh, we can just say, for a, a, a rough statement in this talk, uh, topological order for mixed states means it's not trivial for mixed states, and a trivial mixed state is a mixed state that it's a mixture of trivial pure states. It's good enough for, good enough for now. Again, leaving out all the epsilons and so on. That's a good definition. Um, okay, yeah. This is a kind of background question. Yeah. Um, so if you're Um, well, okay, so we would like to keep, um, and I'm going to give a, a, a more precise statement to the quantum PCP conjecture in a minute, but I think we would like to try to keep it so that every spin interacts with order one other spins, whereas in a hypercube they would interact with many. Yeah, otherwise we would be happy with something like that. You might also ask about generalizations where each spin is allowed to act, interact with many other spins, but then rather than normalizing the energy by the, total, the number of spins, you normalize by the total number of terms in the Hamiltonian and so on. But let me just fix it that each spin should interact with order one other spins. Okay. For some purposes, people are happy with quadratics. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, also for quantum things, it sort of seems like there's some results of... Uh, uh, Aaron Harrell, Fernando Fred, Brandao, that I guess when you, you know, add spins interacting with many spins, sort of then you can have some classical approximation, which will be then less interesting for us. So let me just, for this talk, we'll, okay. we'll really be interested in each spin interacts with only order one. And I'll put that in the statement of the quantum PCP conjecture in a minute. All right. Okay. Uh, questions? Okay. Um, so this has topological order for T smaller than, uh, first T smaller than TC. But it has, um, has low energy states, states without top level order. So um, a natural question is, you know, this kind of looks like this if the analog of topological order is long range order. And this one kind of looks like this one. So the question is, is there a column that's the analog of this column? And the conjecture that there's a column that's the, or a row, sorry, a row that's the analog of this row. The conjecture that there's a row that's the analog of this row is really going to take two different parts. First, the part about is there something with, and I'll make this statement more precise, but we'll just say no low energy trivial states. That is, there's such, you know, just as there's a system with uh, no low energy states that don't have long range ferromagnetic order. Is there a system where there are no um, low energy states that aren't topologically ordered? And uh, similarly, we could ask about the analog of the spin glass column. Sort of remarkably, um, the, the, the quantum thing, if you're looking at uh, questions of um, 
exact ground state or approximation you know, to very high accuracy, approximation of the energy to, to one over polynomial accuracy, things already become QMA hard in one dimension. So in fact, you actually, uh, things become quite hard even in 1D. It's a little bit funny. In this case, things get harder in, in quantum. You don't have to go to as high a dimension. But one question will also be, is there something where hard to approximate, QMA hard to approximate? And this will be the quantum PCP conjecture. So I'm going to sort of state these two conjectures a little bit more precisely. And so the question is, you know, what kind of system should we put here instead of an expander graph? And um, you know, whether we can prove these two properties. Matt, I think you advertised it here and tell us why the dimensions were even. Um, I will, yeah, I will talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. Um, uh, let me maybe write these two conjectures before I talk about that. Um, but I will draw your attention to one sort of interesting heuristic that related to the fact that they're even. In some sense, this one is sort of like the square of this one. 2D is kind of like 1D squared. And 4D is kind of like 2D squared. So this sort of suggests that maybe what we should do is look at something that's like an expander graph squared in some, in some notion. And I'll explain what that might be. Um, it's an interesting combinatorial object. I, I should thank, by the way, I didn't mention my collaborator on a lot of this is uh, Mike Friedman, who is uh, also, um, so, so especially in this work, I'll, I'll discuss that. Uh, um, that work with him. Um, so, uh, so good. So, 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 um, these these conjectures here, this this quantum PCP conjecture and no low energy trivial states. So, uh, quantum PCP conjecture. Quantum PCP. So the conjecture is conjecture. So there exist a whole bunch of constants. Uh, D, epsilon 1, which is smaller than epsilon 2, C1, and C2, such that given Hamiltonian with the following properties, one, uh, every spin has dimension at most D, dim at most D. Um, Every spin is my term for site or degree of freedom or whatever sort of interchangeable. Um, every uh, term in H acts on at most C1 spins. So you know each, each term in H is going to act on O of 1 spins. You don't have any terms that act on sort of unbounded number of spins, but every term acts on a bounded number. Uh, every spin is acted on on by at most C2 terms. And uh, so this is, this is what you were asking earlier. I'm, gonna cons I'm just going to restrict and say, yeah, we'll just assume that each, each one is only participating in some bounded number of terms rather than an unbounded number. I just want to impose that as a constraint. Well, if you're going to say that way, I, I'm just wondering whether logarithms are considered good enough. <coughs> uh, you know, I would, I would still find this to be an extremely interesting conjecture if there were a log in there, too. Um, You'll have to slightly change one thing in, in my final statement, but I would still find it to be an extremely interesting conjecture if it could be proven with a log, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, Is uh, there no black box, black box reduction? For well, I mean, the black box would kind of be to make uh, the terms in the Hamiltonian act on an unbounded number of spins, more than logarithmic, so. Uh, so, um, and, uh, Every term has norm one, and most one uh, has norm uh, operator norm at most one. So the Hamiltonian is a sum of these terms, each with bounded norm. Um, and uh, let E naught be the ground state energy. So it's QMA hard, QMA hard to decide if E naught is smaller than this first constant, epsilon one n or E naught is bigger than epsilon 2 and if, to, to decide which of these two is true, promise that only one of them is true. Um, so if you want to change it to the, there can be, uh, in, by construction here, I have a most order n terms. So you might be allowing, since you're allowing, you might want, great, you might want to allow many terms I can a site. You might want to change my n here to be something that's the number of terms rather than the number of sites or something like that. Um, anyway, that's the quantum PCP conjecture, one formulation. And I guess a number of people 
Um, Dorit, Dorit Harnoff, Itai Aratz, Scott Aronson, uh, several other people, not all of whom have their names start with A, right? Um, but I don't remember all the names, but many people have thought about this question. You probably know the history much better. So many people have thought about it. Um, and uh, we sort of have a, a, a weaker um, conjecture that would, that would have to hold for this quantum PCP conjecture. And this is a conjecture that uh, Mike Freeman and I came up with, the no low energy trivial states conjecture. So before um, stating the conjecture, the conjecture is simply that a family of Hamiltonians with this property that I'll call NLTS exists. So I'll just define what this, this property is. And then the conjecture is just that such a family exists. So uh, given family H sub n of Hamiltonians. So you know H sub n is a Hamiltonian acting on n spins. Uh, we don't demand that they exist for all n, but they should exist for you know a sequence of n that diverges. Um, uh, again, with uh, dimension d is O of one. Each term acts on O of one sites. Each site exactly the same as before. Each site in O of one terms. Um, each term has <coughs> dorm O of one. Uh, let's assume that the minimum eigenvalue is zero. Doesn't mean that it's frustration free, but uh, we're just gonna, you know, just normalize it so that the minimum eigenvalue is zero. H has an LTS. This family has an LTS. Has an LTS if um, there exists an epsilon that's strictly greater than zero. This is this is going to be sort of the measure of what low energy is, such that. There does not exist an R um, such that for all n, uh, there is an R trivial state psi n with psi n, expectation of the energy, psi n hn psi n smaller than epsilon n. So what does this mean? It's a, there's a whole bunch of does not exist and so on. So that means there's some energy epsilon. So this is the measure of low energy. That if you want to build a state for psi n which has energy less than epsilon times n, i.e. has low energy according to this approximation, there's no way to do it as an R trivial state for a fixed R that will work for all n. You know, you might maybe do it with an R that diverges in some way with n, but there's no way to have a single fixed R that works for all n in the family. Is that, does, is that clear? Uh, okay. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's clear, but then if you, the more things you include in your family, the less chance you have. I mean, so can't you just create like an artificial family where you include just so many things that it, this won't have? Um, well, you know, every, again, every term has to act on it most O of one sites. Every site has to, you know. So currently we have absolutely no idea how to prove it. Well, we have some idea how to prove this conjecture based on um, I don't know how much time I'll have left on some topological <coughs> ideas, which I can solve. Let's through. just co co consider the family of all such, of, of all such. such, such um, well, no, no, no. So, so this family means that. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so the family means um, for each, for some set of n, you have some h of n. So you give me a sequence of Hamiltonians. I don't demand it for every n, but for a sequence that goes to infinity. And I, I, I don't think there was an example. I mean. Uh, every example we have, we know how to do. We know how to make this. Um, and and the relation of this, Can no. I, Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. So uh, just to say it in one sentence, it's just that there exist Hamiltonians <coughs> such that below some energy, all states are highly entangled. That's the conjecture. So what would this epsilon have to be for the Torre code in four dimensions? Um, Torre code in 40 is not an LTS. I know, but yeah. Yeah, what, how large is epsilon? Oh, uh, that's a very interesting point. I'm going to talk about that in a second, although I'm probably going to run out of time and get in trouble. Let me talk about that in one second. Well, uh, and that's related to your question, too. They're all kind of related. Do you know, do you know if, if you make R logarithmic? Uh, I don't do you know. Have, 
I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get too far off track. That's a side Yeah, I, I think maybe I have a question related to the other. I, I, I want to get some intuition about these low energy states without topological order. Right? Okay, that's so related to that. I'm going to get to that. Okay, uh, then pause, then pause. I'm going to skip. You, you, uh, you're all going to be much happier in a second. <laughs> um, uh, but briefly, I'm sure it's obvious to everyone, but uh, how this and this relate. If you have a Hamiltonian which does have low energy trivial states, if it comes to deciding this kind of approximation question, um, you can decide the approximation question by using the low energy state, the trivial state as a witness. And for the trivial state, you can give a classical description, you can classically compute expectation bias. So it would not be QMA hard, it would only be NP hard. Um, yes? I, the um, structure of the, the circuit that you assume uh, to be R trivial, does it uh, respect the structure of the graph or not necessarily? Uh, let's for the moment assume it does. You might wonder about less local ones, but let's just use the metric on the graph to measure distances. OK, so many questions about Y2D, why, um, uh, what, the, what the, the energy would have to be um, uh, in order to do this. So let me point out a very important point, and this is sort of crucial to the, the, like the main topological point I wanted to discuss, um, which is, I, I want to I pause briefly on the questions, unless there's like a serious confusion. Um, so let me look at this 2D model here. Suppose, okay, this is the whole, the whole sample, you know, hidden inside are many bounds that I'm not drawing. Imagine we kind of punch some holes out of it. So I'm going to draw these circles. And what I mean by drawing these circles to say punching some holes, you know, so the lattice really has all these sites and bonds and so on. But around these holes that I punch out, I get rid of all the interactions near these holes. So I punch some holes in here. Um, now, this is going to give me a much more efficient way of constructing <laughs> trivial states. This is an interesting thing. You see, if you just sort of thought naively and thought, how can I make a low energy trivial state in 2D or in 4D, you would say, well, let's go back to that patch construction. Let's take the lattice and sort of cut it into patches like this. And then in each patch, we can make an exact state, which will be R trivial with an R that's of order L, the size of the patch. And the energy would be of order 1 over L. But I'm going to tell you that I can do much better. Rather than cutting out this whole line, I can just cut out sort of points on the corners. And I'm going to tell you that this state is still R trivial for an R of order L. And I've paid much less energy price. What I mean by this, by cutting out and still R trivial, means that I'll find an exact ground state of this Hamiltonian that's R trivial. And since I've only removed a few terms, many fewer, it will be a much lower energy. We'll have an energy that's of order 1 over L squared rather than 1 over L. It's not a state that you can actually find. No, no, no. Well, for the, for the, yeah, actually you can. For the torque code. For the torque code, yeah, for the torque code. Um, so the construction, this relies on an idea of uh, Sergei Bravi and collaborators. Um, and and the, the point that Sergei uh, and collaborators made is that if you have a Hamiltonian that's a sum of commuting terms, like this torque code is, and every term acts on at most two sites, so meaning I sort of have some graph of sites and each term connects a pair of sites, then the ground state can be written in an incredibly simple form. It's basically a classical state with some entanglement between each site and its neighbor along the cut. Uh, I, I won't go into the details, but sort of heuristically, if you have a single site that participates in multiple bonds like this, it's possible to do some decomposition in the Hilbert space on the site. First, some sort of restriction to a subspace, and that's where the classical information comes in. That's sort of how this problem remains NP hard. Once you restrict to the subspace, you can then factor the problem into three distinct degrees of freedom that couple each way. So you can make a, a unitary on each site after you restrict to the subspace on each site that then completely factors the problem like this. And you find that there are uh, just now degrees of freedom that only talk to each other like this. So it's, it's R trivial for an R that's order one. It's a very, very simple ground state. And here, I can coarse grain. I can take all the sites inside this big region and group them into one site. I can take all the sites in this region and group them into one site, and so on. So I can do this. And now what I find is that this super site interacts with this super site and so on, but the interaction of super sites is now too local. It's just this one to this one or this one to this one. There's nothing that acts on this, this, and this all at the same time. So it's a much simpler problem. So actually, I can get away with a much lower um, lower energy and still have trivial state in this case. Now, this also answers your question why I had to go to 2D. If I were in 1D, I can always coarse grain to this, at least if I stick to these commuting Hamiltonians, which are the ones we understand better. So, so certainly I have to start in 2D to make things interesting. Um, so this gives us some hint that what we want to look for is we want to look for something where 
You can't coarse grain it to 1D. You also can't coarse grain it to something that's tree-like. So putting the Hamiltonian on an expander graph, you know, if you just had an expander graph, but each term was only coupling neighbors on the expander graph, this will be no good. This will give us a trivial state. So an expander graph will be no good. We need something where the Hamiltonian involves terms that act on more than two sites. But we also want something where we can't coarse grain it to act on more than two sites, you know, to act on only two sites. So for example, if we drew, just to give a kind of uh, you know, funny example, suppose we had a situation where um, I took an expander graph, but every time I had a bond between two sites, I kind of replaced it with this complicated structure. And then the term in the Hamiltonian involved all three things in these triangles, rather than just pairwise interactions. I can now coarse grain it, combine these two sites into one, and now suddenly it's back to the original situation. So I want something that I can't coarse grain to the, to the expander graph. So I have some very strong requirements. I want something where I can't coarse grain it to two local. I want something where I can't remove a few degrees of freedom and then coarse grain it to two local. And um, because if I could do that with removing only a few degrees of freedom, then we'd be done. Now, actually, um, there's some, some technical details that we don't fully have the following statement, but we have it in a lot of situations, that there's even some cases where even if you can locally coarse grain it to two local, but not globally, you can still show there's a trivial state. There's some technical assumptions you need there, and I won't explicitly state what the difference is due to time constraints. Um, but uh, the, the hint then is that we really want things where, yeah, it's sort of very much not too local. There's no way to make it tree-like. There's no way to remove a few things or coarse grain to make it tree-like. So we're, we're kind of looking for manifolds or graphs with a very special property. And I'll try to make that property a little more precise and show what they are and argue that that's a good higher dimensional generalization of um, the expander graph. So there is a term in graph theory called, yeah, I know I'm running no, out of time. No, I think we started late. So okay. how, what, what's your well, I can plan? Sort of. Well, 10 minutes or something? Yeah, yeah, okay, 10 minutes is good. Yeah. 10 minutes is good, okay. Um, so there's a term in graph theory called hyperfinite. And I want to talk briefly about this term before giving the generalization of this and then showing that things exist, uh, which are sort of meet some generals, which fail to meet some generalization of this and then argue that they're a good place to look. Um, so what is... Uh, Hyperfinite meaning graph theory. Hyperfinite is closely related to expansion, but it's not quite the same thing. So a family, it's not a property of a graph, it's a, a family of graphs is hyperfinite. Uh, if for all epsilon greater than zero, you can remove an epsilon fraction of the, of the cells of the, let's say, of the, uh, of the vertices, and then remove all the attached edges. Uh, and the remaining graph becomes disconnected. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I left out. For all epsilon greater than 0, I left out if there exists in R. There exists in R. So that you can move an epsilon fraction of the vertices, and graph um, becomes disconnected regions of size R, uh, disconnected graphs of diameter R. So meaning you, you take out a small amount and then um, you know then it becomes just some disconnected disconnected graphs of this certain diameter, um, and this has to hold for every graph in the family. That is, there's for every epsilon greater than zero, there's some R that will work for every single graph in the family. So um, to give an example of a hyperfinite graph, if you took a square lattice, a, fam a family of square lattices of increasing size, this would be hyperfinite because um, if you tell me you know epsilon is 0.01, I'll just say okay, yeah, you know I'm going to take some some cuts like this and cut everything along these cuts, and then each of these patches has some bounded radius, and I've removed a certain fraction. So there's a way of disconnecting it by removing a small amount, and this is very closely tied to this this classical side. Um, expander graphs would not be hyperfinite. There would be no way to, to do this. A family of expander graphs would not be hyperfinite. So. Um, what we came up with is we came up with a generalization of this definition that we think captures a lot of where you want to look. So um, instead of talking about graphs, it becomes meaningful now to talk about um, 
complexes. So instead of a graph has some vertices, which are like zero dimensional objects, zero cells in the language of simple complexes, edges, which are like one cells, so a graph is just like one complex in this language. But also, you can start talking about, oh yeah, I also want to add in some, uh, you know, fill in some of these faces, that these would be called two cells. And then you might have some higher dimensional objects, like three cells that would be volume and so on. And there are certain rules for how you can glue it together. And this is, this is a description of such an object. So, um, uh, so what we came up with is a notion of um, K hyperfinite. So we say if we have a family not of graphs, but a family of some L complexes. What are, L complexes meaning you have cells up to L. So a graph is a one complex. It has some, some vertices and some edges. A two complex will also have some two dimensional cells and so on like this. So, um, so L complexes, so it will have some L. Something will be K hyperfinite for a K less than L. Um, if for all epsilon greater than zero there exists an R, so that you can remove an epsilon fraction of the zero cells and all the attached higher cells too. And then what is this analog of disconnected? Well, the analog of disconnected is that it becomes k-dimensional. And what does it mean becomes k-dimensional? And so the complex can be mapped continuously to a k-complex. That's why it's k-hyperfinite with the diameter of the pre-images of this map bounded by R. Diam of pre-image at most R. So what, is this, what does this mean? Let me you know, give some sort of intuitive notion. So in the case of zero hyperfinite, zero hyperfinite is hyperfinite in the graph theory language. Why is that? Well, for example, after, this is, um, after I remove all these sites here, I have this patch here. And I can just say, well, I'll take the function which takes this patch and maps this whole patch to a single point. And I do that for each patch. So I've mapped every patch to a point. All I'm left with is a collection of points, which is a zero complex. And the diameter of the preimage is just the diameter of each of these patches. So the, 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 this thing is zero hyperfinite. Any hyperfinite graph, it's the same as saying it's zero hyperfinite. Um, so what would it be to be one hyperfinite? Well, as I, as I said earlier, you know, if we consider a family of expander graphs, this is not zero hyperfinite. There's no way to remove a small fraction and make it hyperfinite. But imagine we took each of these edges and we sort of thickened it into a, a small tube like that. So you, know, you add in then some cells going around the edge of the tube uh, and then fill in the surfaces of those cells so it's really like a two-dimensional surface. And then similarly here, and of course, you know, we then attach all these uh, tubes to a sphere for each vertex. Um, so this would be some two complex, but it would be one hyperfinite. This family, you know, if we take a fixed family of expander graphs and then do this thickening construction, because I can take each of these edges and just map them down to a single line, and I can take each of these spheres and map it to a single point, and that's mapped this thing down to uh, uh, um, a uh, one complex. And I didn't even need to remove anything. I was actually able to do it for epsilon equals zero, not just for positive epsilon. Um, so. So, 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 for example, these things, this is sort of closely tied to this property that you can coarse grain things and make them look like a tree. So we believe that what you want to look at is you want to look at um, complexes which have a property of not being one hyperfinite, things which are sort of intrinsically two-dimensional in some sense. If I want to sort of be a little bit poetic, it means that, you know, in the, in the, in the classical language, what you kind of have is that in expander graph, particles diffuse very well. And it's this great diffusion of particles that means that when you cut out a small fraction of points, the information is still carried. But in the quantum setting, we really wanted the, something where strings can diffuse very well, where it's very hard to come up with a barrier to string motion. If I want to sort of think back to this language where I talked about removing a few points from the square lattice, what happens is that when I remove a few points from the square lattice, sort of a string can get hung up around one of these points and become unable to move well. And the only way the string can kind of move is to extend sort of amoeba-like tendrils, but it can't really sweep out an area. So I kind of look for complexes on which, um, which are not one hyperfinite, where the strings can move very freely, where even if you punch out a few points, the strings can get around them, you know? So like think in three dimensions, if I remove a single point in three dimensions, a string can happily just go around it, you know? But if I remove a line in three dimensions, that can succeed to pin the string. So I need something where there's no way to remove points and yet stop the string motion. Um, and so this is, this is exactly what I'm looking for. So I'll tell you these things do exist. Yes, Dorit. Can you clarify what you mean by 
clarify a little bit more why is it the right thing to look at string motions? That's kind of the intuitive idea. The more precise you know, formulation comes from both this idea um, of, of coarse graining to two local and then the fact that sometimes even when you can locally coarse grain to two local, it's enough. Um, but so, why are you just interested in strings? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, so, so this is a separate question, yes. Really, indeed, we should have a more stringent requirement that, depending upon the code, maybe we are worried about surfaces or higher dimensional objects. So um, let me try and answer that and take three more minutes yeah. and, and finish, yeah. and then I'll, then I'll stop talking. Yeah, Aaron? Yes. So maybe you don't want to get into this, but I wonder how much of this is specialized to the commuting case, because oh, I don't know. in the non-commuting case, we can, this seems like it's deeply about being complexes and not graphs. But in the non commuting case, yes. it's a, the PCP is equivalent to the, two, to the version on graphs. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't okay. know. Uh, I think this is easier to think about for me, at least. But uh, sure. you, certainly, yeah, and we could ask, you know, are these things true? I didn't require in these conjectures that be commuting Hamiltonian. But yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, last, last thing I was going to say. So how do you both prove that these objects exist and sort of answer your question about which ones I should deal with? Basically, the way you prove that they exist is you note that um, to prove that, for example, there exists um, something that's not one hyperfinite. How do I construct such a family of manifolds whose triangulation will give me uh, something that's not one hyperfinite? Um, the, key, the key is to look at uh, the Betty number. So what I can do is... is uh, you, you can construct various um, uh, manifolds, for example, four-dimensional hyperbolic manifold, compact four-dimensional hyperbolic manifold. So the second Betty number can be made to be proportional to the system size, so that the second Betty number is extensive. So first Betty number sort of counts the number of non-trivial loops in there. The second Betty number is sort of some analogous thing for surfaces. So you can come up with something where, by accounting, another one that will do it, and this gets back to sort of my original analogy, is expander graph crossed with itself. There's a way of constructing a complex, which is the, basically the square of the expander graph. Again, that has extensive second Betty number. And you can show sort of two things very roughly that removing zero cells only drops the Betty number by one. So removing if you have an extensive Betty number and you remove a small fraction of zero cells, you're still with a non-zero Betty number, second Betty number. And then that is an obstruction to mapping it, um, in this case, to mapping it onto a one complex. So this gives us a construction of these things and it relies on these higher Betty numbers. But the important thing then is also that sort of, um, in the 40 tor code we might have uh, both worry about surfaces um, but we might also want to worry about sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, lines or, um, uh, or, or volumes or whatever. And so different ones will depend upon different Betty, Betty numbers. So it seems that a lot of the important construction might be to find something where you don't just have an extensive Betty number in the middle dimension, but outside the middle dimension. And so the suspicion is that if such could be constructed, that this would be a way to um, really uh, uh, come up with the example that once you construct that family of manifolds, then you can just put the code on it and you've got, you've solved the NLTS. So I think I'm getting pretty far afield and I'm basically out of time, so. Okay. Are there questions right now? Right, one so, question. There are many questions. <laughs> uh, so are these things related to, you know, Alex Lubotsky and people around him have this notion of high dimensional expanders? Yeah, I know there's several notions of higher dimensional expanders. I think this is a distinct notion of higher dimensional expanders, yet another one. So I, I think there are several that are not equivalent. I think this is yet another one. And I, hopefully it will be interesting to comment on lists. So I guess, uh, speaking as a condensed micro person, I was a little unclear on what the motivation was. Is this an important end result or end goal in information theory? Or uh, I, I would say this would be, um, okay, I can give you two answers to that. I think. The computer scientists would say that this is a very important end goal, probably. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay, if, if I'm to answer, I think that, I, I don't know if this is the end goal, but I think that it just sort of connects many, many beautiful questions about the nature of entanglement and the nature of topological order, that uh, it sort of highlights them <coughs> and isolates them in a very beautiful way. So, so to me, you know, they, they sort of the computer scientists, of course, came up with all this conjecture, the theorem in the classical case. To me, the, the interesting thing is that when I first heard this conjecture, I said this is obviously false for quantum systems, and the sort of the intuition was that, well, 
non-zero temperature. Somehow entanglement should only be up to some length scale because I'm at non-zero temperature. But then you start getting into questions like, well, of course, the 40 Tor code does have long-range entanglement, but only not that much of it at non-zero temperature. But then you also get sort of up to questions of, yeah, well, what would it mean that if I sort of understood local density matrices of the system, can I reconstruct the global state? So it seemed to get at a lot of interesting questions of uh, reconstruction of global state from local information. So, so that was why I liked it. This is an unrelated question that was also bothering me. Uh, the received wisdom is that for thermalizing states, all excited states have volume low entanglement. Um, so what does it mean to say that there are low entanglement states? Well, certainly not all. I mean, you, there may be a question about what the eigenstates are of certain uh, non-inscrutable systems. But certainly there are states of low energy that are not very entangled for all these systems. Other? It was not quite clear. So, at the end, uh, what the, the, the question about commuting versus non-commuting. So, so could it be that that it's, these homotopies are only consist of commuting terms? Uh, so, so uh, my guess would be that if there's no energy trivial states is true, which I'm starting to believe, maybe that one probably is true. But that might be true just when we restrict to commuting. Certainly, it will be much easier to analyze. Um, but it's enough. It would be enough to look at commuting to find. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any theorem that says that if it's true, it has to be true for commuting or anything like that. But intuitively, I think in that case, it's probably enough to look for commuting. But for the QMA hardness, which I then don't think is true, but if it were true, you probably would need to look beyond commuting. But those are just very vague intuitions. So, uh, a related question. That, so the exact claim is that if it is commuting, that it ought to be a K hyperfinite uh, complex, so what is the exact claim? Oh, well, no, the, the claim is that um, if I have, I can't quite prove the following statement, but I can prove it if you give me one or two extra technical assumptions, that if it's commuting and it's one hyperfinite, then it has low energy trivial states. I can't quite prove that. I can prove it with a couple extra technical assumptions, and I would believe that it's true in general. So let's look for things that are commuting and are not one hyperfinite. It sort of seems so intuitive, too, that we should look for something where you know the, the strings can move very freely. And so since we, we now have these examples, we should look we should look to them. As but a then is there a merit to uh, distinguishing between two hyperfinite and three hyperfinite? There, there may be, yeah. This gets to the, the question over there of like, you know, what about lines or surfaces or so on? Because the point is that with the Toric code, you know, when I put the Toric code in a certain dimension, like two dimension, um, or in two dimension, there's there's sort of these these two kind of loop operators that both have dimension one, and so for the the, the thing to be interesting, it would have to not be uh, one hyperfinite, it would have to be at least two dimensional. So depending upon what your loop operators are, you know, if you put a certain code down where you have things of dimension four and dimension five, you might want it. You know, that that will tell you what not hyperfinite it should be. So so yeah, you, you, you also want these higher ones, but the higher ones are also not so hard to construct. So for example, you could take the cube or the fourth power of the expander graph, and that will give you, you know, higher powers of this by the same Betty number argument. But it would be re really funny if, let's say, for 23, all of a sudden, you would have any uh, construction, and for 22, you wouldn't. So it, I mean, you, you feel that it either stops at 2 or 3, or? Yeah, I mean, I can imagine that you might want to go, yeah, maybe not just 2 or 3, but you know, 2, 3, 4, something small, because in some cases, you know, because you sort of wind up doubling some of the dimension because the two degrees of freedom, the, the electric and magnetic have, uh, and then maybe not things don't interesting don't happen in the first. So maybe you have to go up to four or something. But yeah, probably not like forever. Matt, you did say your result, your one-sided NLTS. Oh, I didn't say that. Yeah. Okay. So last thing I mentioned since the desk. Um, one thing that's interesting is that if you look at the graph cross graph, which is this expander graph squared, um, we don't yet have a construction of NLTS on it. But we proved that if you put the toric code on that, it has sort of a one-sided version, that if you force no error in the electric or magnetic, depending upon your notation, then there's no way to obtain a, a, a trivial state with low error in the other side. So you sort of can't go allow error in both, but you can allow error in one, but not the other. It's one <coughs> specific one. There's one that's not error, and it's not either one. But it's Is there a unique way of putting this toric code on the expanded graph? Or there's difference? There's probably difference. So if you just put the toric code on the expanded graph, it's sort of not so interesting, because there's only two cells and zero cells, so there's no plaquette operators. But if you put the toric code on graph cross graph, it's quite interesting. Okay. So, so maybe, maybe uh, did you, did you go else and 
you know, so the NLTS is a, is a step towards the TCP? Yeah, yeah. But, but you believe the NLTS? I, I would believe NLTS, but not believe PCP, but <laughs> you, you don't, I don't know, I don't know. But I mean, I, I'm not sure on either one. Okay, well maybe we should, maybe we'll talk later.